In the summer of 2015, Russian billionaire Yuri Milner, physicist Stephen Hawking, and Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg founded Breakthrough Listen, an expensive scientific research program aimed at finding evidence of civilizations beyond Earth. But science writer Sarah Scholes says despite committing $100 million to the project, they might still miss E.T.'s phone call. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Hi, thanks for having me. So Breakthrough Listen boasts that their instruments are 50 times more sensitive than existing telescopes. Their radio surveys cover 10 times more of the sky than previous programs, and they cover five times more of the radio spectrum, and they cover it 100 times faster. How is it possible that they could still miss ET? <laughs> I know, it seems impossible, doesn't it? Um, and all of those things are totally true. Um, they're using some of the world's best telescopes, um, like the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia and the Parkes Telescope in Australia. These are really huge radio antennas. Um, they're collecting tons of data, and it really is like a giant leap from where we were before. Um, but, and there is a but, um, you have a couple of problems or things that they could be working on. Um, the first is that they haven't finished building the software that actually analyzes their data. And so they're collecting all of this, but they haven't actually had a chance to look at most of it yet. Um, so if there is a phone call from ET or, you know, the Encyclopedia Galactica that could actually still just be sitting on a hard disk somewhere in an office and they wouldn't have any idea um, and they wouldn't have been able to check back on it and go back and look and see if the signal is still there um, or if it has disappeared. Um, and so if they look back later, you know, they get around to the data in a year or so, they check back. Um, if the signal is gone, they don't know if the aliens stopped talking to us because we weren't listening or if maybe it was just, you know, a, an airport radar all along. And um, when you have a big lag, it's hard to tell the difference between the two when they disappear. And um, the second problem is that they're using only one telescope at a time right now. And that makes it hard for them to tell the difference between these alien signals and human signals um, because our technological sig signals could look a lot the same as an alien signal might. Um, and if you have two telescopes looking at the same spot in the sky at the same time, only one of them will see, say, a satellite passing over, and that satellite won't appear in the other one. So if you see something in both telescopes, that's a good indication that it's coming from space. But if you only have one, you can't really make that distinction. And so, um, yeah, they're not guaranteed to, to know what they're looking at. And so is that what happened in August with the, uh, when the Russians thought they saw, thought, saw uh, some kind of message coming from star? I have this in my notes. One, six, four, five, nine, five. Oh, that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I have that written down somewhere on the side so I don't forget the name also. Um, so these Russian astronomers saw a burst of radio waves coming from this star. It's a star that's a lot like the sun. It's about 94 light years away. Um, and all they knew was that they saw a strong burst of radio waves um, that was fast. And they thought, that looks interesting. That could be from someone's technology. Um, but they didn't say anything about it for uh, right around a year, I think. And so no one could go follow up on it and see if they saw it or see if maybe it was a satellite or a radar or some other kind of human technology. And so, yeah, when you, when you have this lag and no one can kind of double check your work or learn more about the signal than um, when people did go back in August, they didn't see anything. And so now it's kind of just this shoulder shrug um, and not verifiable. And so some astronomers in the SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence community are worried that Breakthrough Listen is setting themselves up to have exactly this kind of problem. I have to imagine that one thing that scientists and, and astronomers and everything are kind of investigating this sort of stuff, looking for extraterrestrials in the sky or extraterrestrial signals of some sort, are really good at, definitely at one thing, and that's identifying false positives. Because, I mean, at this point, anything that's been noticed, unless there's some conspiracy to keep it from everybody, you know, <laughs> that there's actually been contact, uh, it's all been false positive, right? Right, right. Yeah. Um, and if there is a conspiracy, I hope that someone will tell me. But as far as I know, there there isn't one. Um, but yeah, I mean, the signals like the ones that the Russian astronomers found actually SETI projects get millions of those every year. It's not uncommon at all. Everything, basically everything that you own emits radio waves and radio telescopes can pick those up. You know, satellites, cell phones, microwaves, Wi-Fi networks. Um 
things that look like they might be from aliens are usually just from us and they're all false positives. And so that is probably the biggest part of um, an alien hunter's job is knocking out all of our stuff. <laughs> well, you have a great anecdote, uh, uh, anecdote in your story about Contact, the movie Contact, which is one of my favorite movies. Um, and it, t- it was sort of gives a good example of what you were talking about, these like follow-up detection devices. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, a study project called Project Phoenix, um, which was a, a privately funded <clears throat> excuse me, project just like through Listen. Um, they um, they use two telescopes, um, like I mentioned earlier, to look at a star and then have the other one looking at the same star. And they had a follow-up detection device at each one where it would process the data in real time. And then if it saw something interesting, thought I think that looks like it would send the telescopes back right away to look at it again and to look for these indications that it was a false, false positive. Um, and then one day, their second telescope was broken and they said, you know, well, we'll observe anyway. It'll be fine. And, you know, they got a signal. It looks suspicious. And they didn't have this second telescope um, and the or the follow-up detection device. And so they spent a long time... Um, 12 hours, I think, thinking that maybe they had gotten in touch with an alien civilization. And it turned out that it was the um, Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, which is a satellite telescope that just happened to be passing over the Earth, looking a lot like a message from aliens. And so, yeah, I mean, just one day of having it down and they got a a very convincing false positive. And Jodie Foster calls her computer fu- Elmer, right? right? So which is right. the, for FUD follow-up detection device. <laughs> right. Sorry, I forgot the actual context part of that. Yes, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's her favorite movie. So. Yeah. <laughs> so um, back around 2000, I was very proud of my Steady at Home screensaver. I would keep it on all my new devices, um, and I would be, you know, helping with the search for extraterrestrials. Does Is there anything like that now? Does that, does that Is there anything that we can do on our own? own um, iPhones or iPads to help? Yeah, actually, study at home still exists. It's still going on. And actually, it is processing some of the data from Breakthrough Listen. And most of the data that has been processed so far from Breakthrough Listen has happened uh, using study at home. So you should you should totally re-download it and start that screensaver back up again. And so, yeah, all you need is a computer and it will process data for scientists and they will greatly appreciate you and you know maybe if we find an alien civilization you'll get some credit <laughs> oh the, the Mar- maroni made touch yeah. uh, with aliens <laughs> um so one thing one theme that's been recurring throughout the course of this year since since megan and i have started doing this show is artificial intelligence neural networks all of these you know these computers kind of learning and, and thinking basically through problems and just the, the world that that's opening up. It's this whole kind of evolution of computing that's taking place right before our eyes right now. Is there any mm-hmm. possibility that that, or maybe it already is, I have to imagine possibly to a certain degree it is, but does it ever scale to a point to where maybe, maybe the integration of AI and uh, neural networks can help improve kind of analysis and detection so that you know when things come in, they don't sit for months and months undiscovered that it all actually all happens in real time. Is that at all where this is headed? Sure, definitely. And a lot of the searches that are going on right now, like the SETI Institute has a search going on at a telescope in Northern California that processes in real time. Um, but where, where I think that neural network and um, artificial intelligence are going for SETI is actually learning how to see different kinds of signals. Right now, I know there's a collaboration between the SETI Institute and IBM where they're giving lots of their data to IBM and uh, having their computers kind of learn to look for signals that we don't know how to look for yet because there's no guarantee that we actually know what an alien signal looks like. And so um, it's kind of learning what what we maybe haven't thought of yet. Um, And Breakthrough Listen is also working toward the goal of processing in real time. They're just not not quite there yet. It's a ton of data, you know, terabytes and terabytes, but they're definitely working with it and doing collaborations with the computing industry to make it happen, hopefully soon. So do you think the truth is out there? (laughs) I I really like to think so. You know, the universe is a very big place with a lot of... uh, 
planets and possibilities. And um, I like to imagine, at least in my head, that it's out there. <laughs> well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Sarah Skulls is a contributor to Wired Science. She also writes for Motherboard and The Atlantic, Slate, Popular Science, and more. She's the author of the forthcoming book, Making Contact, Jill Tarter and the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. It comes out in July 2017, but you can order it now. Pre-order it now on Amazon. She can also be found at sarahskulls.com. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Sarah. Later.